Well, here we are at the tenth plague. The appeals have been made for nine devastating plagues. God has made an appeal to the heart of Pharaoh to let his people go. But he, Pharaoh, has refused again and again. The familiar frame that we read of Pharaoh hardening his heart is seen time and again. He will not repent. He will not change his mind. He will not humble himself to God. Sadly, tragically, regrettably, for Pharaoh, this day has arrived. Moses will not make an appeal to Pharaoh to repent. He's not making an appeal to him as we read this scripture to change his mind. That time has passed. That opportunity is gone, and it's gone forever. God is a God of grace. He's a God of mercy. But he's also perfectly holy. God has been gracious to this man up to the present, but no more. We need to understand that God will judge sinners who refuse to humble themselves to him. That's what we see today. I've thought to myself throughout these, these plagues, and I, I've mentioned it before, but it didn't have to be this way. We didn't have to come to this point, but we have. Pharaoh could have changed the outcome and his destiny and the destiny of his people in a moment. He could have turned this nation toward God in repentance, but he wouldn't. One of the regrets of the forever lake of fire for those who experience it will be that they have refused God's gracious offer of escape from his wrath. The regret of having rejected God's way of salvation, a hardening of one's heart to God will be ever present forever, day after day after week after week. How tragic. Let's notice this last plague. Chapter 11, verse 1, Now the Lord said to Moses, One more plague. And I'll bring Pharaoh, and I, I will bring on Pharaoh and, and on Egypt, and after that he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he'll surely drive you out from here completely. This last plague is explained to Moses. I've read some of it here. God communicated this, communicated this final plague to him. And God says to Moses, one more plague. One more. Not three more. Not two more. Not ten more. This is it. You're to speak to the people, verse 2. Now in the hearing of the people, you're to speak that each man may ask of his neighbor and each woman from her neighbor of articles of silver and articles of gold. God said this would happen. They would plunder the Egyptians. The Israelites would. And notice verse 3, the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. These were their slaves. They've gone through these plagues with them, but these Egyptians are looking up to them because of their God, the God of heaven. Furthermore, Moses himself is greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt, both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. It's amazing what's happened here. This play is, is explained to Moses. He would instruct the Hebrews, both men and women, they're to ask their neighbors. Notice as well how Moses is esteemed. Remember one of the objections that Moses had when God called him? They won't listen. I can't speak. They won't listen. You see the grace of God in his life and that he's greatly esteemed. This man that has boldly gone before Pharaoh time and again and said, let my people go. They are looking up to him. That's the grace of God. And it's not only the people, it's the servants of Pharaoh that, that see him that way. So that concern, that's in the distant past. His greatest fear became an amazing blessing from God. And that's often how it is when we step out and serve the Lord. His grace is sufficient. This last plague explained to Moses. There's this great cry in verse 6. It's going to come onto Egypt and death is going to come. He relays it to Pharaoh in verse 4. About midnight, and I believe this will happen four days from when Moses says it. I'll get into that a little later. But about midnight, I'm, I'm going to the midst of Egypt, God says. And, I, and, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. What an amazing pronouncement of judgment. You would think at that point, Pharaoh's on his knees before God. It says, okay, enough. Because every time Moses has spoken the word of God, it has come true. And yet, the stubbornness, the hard-heartedness 
persists. He relays it to Pharaoh. There's a severity here, the timing of it. It's at midnight. It's going to happen. It'll impact you. It's going to touch all of Egypt. This plague is unique. The severity of it is dramatic to a degree that he and his nation have never experienced. People are going to die. Four, year, four days from this pronouncement, people are going to die at, at midnight. Every household in Egypt would have a person dead in it. The grieving would be experienced by all. So here it is. Pharaoh has brought himself to this moment. He's brought his friends to this moment. He's brought the nation to this moment. They are on the edge of the cliff of God's judgment. Why? Why? Well, because he's a hard-hearted, proud man. You know, pride and resistance to God is something I believe is in every one of us. And praise God that he breaks through at times and we're able to humble ourselves to him. And I was thinking back of all the times that, that, that Moses went to Pharaoh, and I've got 10 of them listed here. 318, let us go. Exodus 318, let us go. That's what God has said. Exodus 4, 20 through 23, let my son go that he may serve me. Exodus 5, 1, let my people go. This is God speaking through Moses to Pharaoh, let my people go. Chapter 7, verse 16, let my people go. Chapter 8, verse 1, let my people go. Chapter 8, verse 20, let my people go. Chapter 8, verse 21, let my people go. Chapter 9, verse 1, let my people go. Chapter 9, verse 13, let my people go. 10, 3, let my people go. I can understand that. It's not a mystery as to what God wanted from Pharaoh. God's made an appeal to him time and time again. Not just once, not twice, not three times. I count ten times that God has vocally spoken through Moses to, to Pharaoh to let his people go. Now, we wish we could say that that only happened to Pharaoh, right? But often God speaks clearly to us. And we'll say, one of these days, right? Or maybe I'll get to it, or I'm not ready for it. I don't know. Uh, you know, it takes an adult, I think, around 10 times or so to hear the gospel before they respond. Children, their hearts aren't so cluttered with pride and, and so forth. They can respond often much quicker. I would say to you today, those online, if you've been putting off trusting Christ as Savior, today is the day. Today's the day. There's no sense waiting. Brothers and sisters, if God is speaking something into your life, and he's challenging you, he's putting something before you, and you're putting it off, today's the day as well. Today's the day. Well, this is what God told Pharaoh back in 423. Let my people go. But he said this, you've refused to let them go. Behold, I will kill your firstborn. And you guys know the truth about God's word, right? He keeps it. We've come to this point. We've come to this point. God had not forgotten how the previous Pharaoh, not this Pharaoh, but the previous Pharaoh, had dealt with the male babies in Egypt. It goes way back, some 400 years earlier. And he had commanded that they be killed. Remember when we started with Moses' life, how he was protected from that edict from the king? They were commanded to kill the, the Hebrew males. Throw them in an aisle, kill them, get rid of them. And God says, okay, that's how you want to do it? I got something for you. My judgment, you're going to feel the heat of my judgment in a similar way. It's coming back to you. I'm going to do the same, but to a greater degree. This is an aspect of God that is often sidestepped today. Our God is gracious to a degree that's amazing. He's loving to a degree that's incomprehensible. He's, 
He's merciful. That is withholding judgment to us in, in, in a way that's, that, that's inescapable. And here's our God. And yet, that same God, part of his character is this. He's holy. He's just. He will and must judge sin and sinners. Pharaoh could have escaped that. He's not going to. He could have. There's an exemption to this plague. You'll see it in verse 7. But against any of the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And God's saying, you know what? Over there in Goshen, remember the last plague? It was darkness. And there was darkness on Egypt such as you could feel it. But over in Goshen, The sun was shining, the moon was clear to see. There was an exemption from the third plague on of the people of God and the people of Egypt. Here, the exemption is is spoken to as well. There's not even good, a dog not barking means there's no stirring in Goshen. There's no stirring in the Israelite camp. All is calm while there's something very different going to go on in Egypt. So there's this exemption. Look at chapter 12, verse 23. You'll take a bunch of hyssop and dip into the blood which is in the basin, apply some of the blood that's in the basin to the lentil, to the two doorposts, and none of you should go outside the door of his house until morning. And this is how the exemption is, is, is granted. God is going to say to them, this is what I want. You're going to choose a lamb. You're going to slay that lamb on the fourth day. Uh, you're going to roast it and so forth, but you're going to keep part of the blood. You're going to apply that blood. Put the blood in the basin, you're going to put it on the, 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 the lintel and the doorpost. That's how this exemption is granted. And so here it is. God is just pronouncing this judgment. He's not, going to, he's not going to Pharaoh in an appeal. He's not doing that anymore. God goes through Moses and he says, this is what's going to happen. And furthermore, He says, verse 8, look at this. All these your servants will come to me and bow themselves before me. That's astounding. That's astounding. We can read right over it. See, Pharaoh is seen as a god. And all the plagues that we've gone through are are going precisely to a god that was worshipped in Egypt. And Pharaoh, as he's looked up as a god, Moses is making this pronouncement. and, And he's saying, look, Pharaoh, your servants, they're going to come to me. And they're going to bow before me. They're going to say, get out. Get out of the land. Go. Go. No longer. We don't want you here any longer. And Pharaoh's hearing this. And I thought, well, what does he think in hearing this? I, it has to be a, a blow to a man's pride. But yet, here again, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't bow himself. Moses goes out in a, a Pharaoh in hot anger. He's been in the middle of this. Moses has. He's been pronouncing it. He's been dealing with it. God's word goes forth. Verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, and so forth. Chapter 12, verse 1. Here's the Passover. Here's what's instituted. This is what's going on. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be a beginning of months to you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, and here Passover is instituted for Israel. Uh, you are to take a lamb for yourselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. If the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to the house are to take one according to the number of the persons in them, according to what each should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb, listen, shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day on the month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts, on the lintel of the houses which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh the same night, roasted with fire. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head, its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. 
Why? For I'll go through the land of Egypt on that night. I'll strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And where I see the blood, I'll pass over you, that no plague will befall you or destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this day will be a memorial to you. You shall celebrate it as a feast of the Lord. Passover instituted. Here we just have it laid out for us. This one way. I want you to note that there's one way here. Moses goes to the elders of Israel. He lays it out before them. What you'll notice is that God was very specific in what he required of them. An exact time, an exact animal, an exact application. This is the way that God ordained to secure life for those who would act in faith. Do you suppose this would have seemed absurd to some or foolish to others? It may have. I'm not sure. Certainly, I believe it would have to those in Egypt. Do you think perhaps that some thought, what in the world are we, we, we doing? What are these Egyptians going to think when they see us or hear of us slaying a lamb, taking this, this hyssop branch and smearing blood on the door and on the lintel, or on the lintel and on the doorpost? I, I don't know for sure. They may have thought that. But I want you to know something about the cross, something about the preaching of the cross, and the way God has laid before us our, uh, our path to him today. For the word of the cross or the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. You know, the gospel itself is mocked and ridiculed today. That one man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God himself, would take on the sin of the world and pay our sin debt and rise again the third day in triumph. And through faith in him, one is made right to God. That's mocked and ridiculed in the world today. But that's God's way. This is his way. This is the one way. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you were an Israelite back in the day, you had to take a lamb. It had to be unblemished. It had to be a year old. There's no other way. You can't say, well, there's... Why not this? Why not that? Why not that? That's not going to that's not going to pass. And today, so many think there are so many ways to God. I got my way, I got my truth. You got your way, you got your truth. In the end, we all end up in the same way. I beg to differ. Jesus said something. The one who died rose again never to die again said this, "I am the way. I'm the truth, I'm the life. There's no other way to have a relationship with God." There's no other way. If you want to be right with God, this is the one way. He shed his blood. He paid our sin debt. This is the one way. Well, there's that lamb chosen. It had to be without blemish. You can be sure it was looked over very carefully for all those days. And th- these, these Israelites were to do so. They were to, this, this night, they were to be ready to go. Have your loins girded. Get ready for your exit. Today, we don't have to slay a lamb. He's already been slain. There's a picture here that I want us to remember. They were ready to go in a moment. And we ought to be the same. Do you know the next event on God's prophetic calendar is the catching away of his church? I think of this often. I think of especially the way the world is today. I, I'm. It's like, What's next week going to bring? What, how deep is going to be the sinfulness of man displayed in a week from now? What are we going to read? What are we going to see? Boy, in the last few years, we are just on a, on a snowball downhill as far as society. And we're not, America isn't, I want you to know, we're right where the world is. The other countries are seeing the same thing. And I just think any time our Lord's going to step out and, Catch his bride. The rapture is the great, next great moment. We need to be living expectantly for that moment. These Jewish people, the Israelites, the Hebrews, God said, get ready. When you slay that lamb, I want you ready. Make sure you got your belt firmed up and your shoes on, your sandals on. You got to be ready to go because the next morning they would. They would plunder the Egyptians and go. But there's the blood applied. That's the action they had to take. Again, 
let's look at it in, in chapter 12. Verse 13. That's not the verse I want. Verse 23. See that again. When he sees the blood on the lentil and on a two-door post, the Lord will pass over the door, will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses. They needed to act in faith. That's what they needed to do. As they leave Egypt, the wailing of the Egyptians can be heard in the dis distance. It would go on. But the blood on the lentil and the door posts speak to God's grace to them. And it is the work of God that we believe. Jesus said something, John 6.29, I think that is so special. Jesus' answer said to them, this is the work of God. This is our action. That you believe in him whom he has sent. That's the action point. So in the days ahead, the Egyptians and others would travel through that ghost town that was once inhabited by Goshen. And there would have been over a million occupants there. And there would be a similar scene in front of every one of those houses. A dark spot above the door and the doorpost, the blood of the Lamb. Their God, the God of heaven, delivered them out of death into life. Now, the same was not true of, gods, of the gods of Egypt, small g. They were powerless to deliver them at all. The midnight cry was heard in Goshen. Death, however, didn't come to those Israelites. That's what the Israelites left behind, some spots on the door. A testimony to the grace that God offered them by which they freely partook. And having done so, they escaped the wrath to come. It's a testimony of grace. What legacy, what testimony will you leave behind? Will it be one of having seen yourself as a, as a sinner in need of a savior? Will it be one where I mean, they were a really religious person? They did all the, these, these things and things and things and works and stacked it up. Or will it be that they saw themselves in need? Of a savior will it be one of having trusted the lamb of god for freedom from sin's consequences you know in heaven in heaven there will be a forever reminder of our lord's sacrifice for sins it's part of that song in in revelation 5 verse 9 they sang a new song saying worthy are you the lord jesus that cry in chapter 5 is someone worthy to open the book were there you to take the book and break its seals, for you were slain. And you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We're going to sing it. That will, he will be there. I believe in his glorified body. We saw after the cross the nail prints in his hand and his side, his feet. It's a forever reminder of his grace, of his sacrifice, of the blood that was shed, that we might be made new. The blood applied. Have you applied the blood? Have you trusted Christ as Savior? Have you come to a point where you've said, I, I, I am a sinner. I, I can't save myself. I can't live up to God's expectations in his call for my life. And I need a Savior. I want to say to you, he's provided one. He's provided a lamb. And your access point is to make a decision to trust him as Savior. Look at the promise. It's in chapter 13 again. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Again, verse 23. When he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. Well, here's the deal. And I've alluded to it. Christ is our Passover. He's our lamb. There was a price for the redemption of Israel. Blood had to be shed. A lamb had to die. That was God's prescription for release from the bondage that the Hebrews lived in, that they may experience life. It is his prescription for us as well. 
John the baptizer pointed to Jesus and said this in John 1 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What did the Passover picture? 1 Corinthians 5 7. Last part of that verse. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Our Passover lamb. Christ, our Passover lamb. He came for you. He came for me. I stand justified by faith in Christ because of this. Because of our Passover lamb. He paid a debt I couldn't pay. The perfect, sinless sacrifice. What is its relevance today? Man is in need of a redeemer, someone to pay his sin debt. God has sent a redeemer. It is his son who came to seek and to save the lost. The Lamb of God shed his blood for the sin of mankind. We apply the blood through placing our faith in him as our sin bearer. When we do, when we do, we pass out of death into life. Truly, truly, Jesus said in John 5, 24, I say to you, he who hears my word believes him who sent me, has, present tense, eternal life, and does not come into judgment, but has passed, I, I love this phrase, has passed out of death into life. See, if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as Savior, God's wrath is on you. It's like that last plague. It's coming. And he makes an offer, and it's good for as long as you're alive. And then it expires. But he says to you and me, he longs to save us. He wants us to come. He wants to give us eternal life. He wants us to pass out of death into life. That happens the moment you trust Christ as Savior. Today's the day of salvation. That's why the scripture says that. You and I don't have tomorrow. We don't have this afternoon. We have now. And I, I've called on people time and again. If you're here today without Christ, right where you're at, you can ask him to save you, and the scripture says he will. You can trust him as Savior right there. There have been people saved in those pews you're in. Today's the day. Acts 16, 30 to 31, Paul and Silas had been beaten. The Philippian jailer, there was an earthquake. God sent it. Uh, Paul and Silas, who had been in chains, were loosened. This Philippian jailer was going to take his life because to lose a prisoner was to lose his life. He had a sword ready to take his life. This is a question he asked after he brought them out. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Here's the answer. The simplicity of the gospel. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. He offers us this gift of salvation to anyone who would believe but the offer expires when you do or when christ comes well a couple truths to live by I'll give you a bunch i want to just finish with two and then we're going to finish with that song that you learned today and i hope you'll sing it with a greater zeal having understood as a believer what god has done through faith in christ Amazing that he would save us. Well, two things. God's word holds true. God said to Moses, Pharaoh's not going to let you go. Not under any circumstance, but when I finally give that last peg, he'll finally let you go then. But until then, not happen. He told Pharaoh, I'm going to take your firstborn, and he did. God's word holds true. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. God's word holds true. No matter what you hear out there, no matter what the world says or other, even churches say, God's word holds true. Secondly, this is just something else I want you to hang on to. By faith in Christ, we pass out of death into life. Amen. 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 We escape judgment to come when we trust Jesus Christ as Savior. I would encourage you to make that decision, if you're not today, to trust Christ. This is God's offer of passing out of death into life. And I want to say again, there's no other way. There's no other way. Man has devised a bunch of other ways that he says gets them there. There's no other way. 
God is the one who justifies. And God says it is this way or no way. It's his way. This is God's offer of passing out of death in eternity in a place called the lake of fire and into life. But again, the offer expires when you do. Believe, trust, rely upon the finished work of Christ on your behalf and you will be saved. For those of us who know him, let us bless his name. Let us praise him. I'm going to pray and ask the worship team to come. We'll finish with this song. Then you'll be dismissed. I'll stay at the front. Any one of those questions or thoughts, you come up at that point. Let's pray. Loving Father, that you would stoop to sinful man to give your son and think of him, think of us in doing so, and that Jesus would come loving and graciously paying our sin debt is an amazing thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what Jesus has done. Thank you that through faith in him we've been released. We've passed out of death into life. And, and we praise your name. We exalt in you. And Father, we're going to sing this song from our hearts just in, in worship and adoration. I would pray that if there's some here today, either online or in this congregation, that have yet to trust Christ, you would move them to that right now. In Jesus' name, amen.